All right, so we're interested in those rays rather than just the wave fronts. And so we can see what direction the light is going and what it's gonna do. And so we'll take a lot of advantage of drawing the rays, which I guess I could have like highlighted here. These are the rays. A lot of times you find them in text and their textbooks and they're drawn in red. So those are all the rays, all these arrows pointing out. And they just, again, they're perpendicular where they cross a wave front and they point in the direction that the wave is actually going. Uh, next here is reflection of light. Uh, we're still going on that as one moves farther from the point of the wave surface. If the wave is spherical, as you go out and you get further and further from it, it, be, it basically becomes a larger and larger sphere. And if you get really, really far away from something that's spherical, or if your sphere gets really, really, really big, I should say, as the sphere gets really, really big, and you're close to it, what does it start to look like? Flat. Yeah, look at look, look at Earth. Earth, you've been told, right, is a sphere. Does it look like it to you every day? Or does it look flat? It looks flat because you're really close to it. And it's very big. If you go really far away from it, it starts to look spherical again. But it's got a big giant radius. And so from our perspective up close here, it's flat. So if you're far enough away from a spherical wave source, the wave fronts coming to you will be plane waves or approximated by plane waves with rays that are all parallel to each other. Okay, it'll look like more like that picture over here on the right, the wave fronts that are plane waves. All right, and so light coming from the sun, we would consider as plane waves because it has a 93 million mile radius. That's a very, very large sphere, and it is very, very flat for all the purposes we would have to worry about here, okay? Now, how does light reflect? Well, light reflects off of surfaces at the same angle that it comes in at. These angles we measure from the normal of the surface, right, from a perpendicular line coming from the surface, the normal to it, and we call one the angle of incidence, that's the angle it comes in at, and then we have the angle of reflection, which is the angle it comes out at. And again, we measure it from the normal, as you can see in that picture. It bounces off at the same angle it comes in at. All right, almost like, you know, throwing something, a ball off the wall, whatever angle it hits out, assuming the ball isn't like spinning or something, whatever angle it hits out is the angle it's going to bounce off at. This does the same sort of thing. Okay. Still see some people writing, so I don't know if I'm going too fast. Few more seconds of uncomfortable silence and then we'll move on. All right. Don't forget these notes are all online for you too. So here you can see we have two different types of reflection. We have reflections off of nice smooth surfaces. These are called specular reflections where the light rays that come in parallel all reflect off parallel. That's there on the left for picture A specular reflection. This would be off of things like glass or you know, off of a mirror or a nice newly polished car or something like that. Uh, and then the next thing we have is diffuse reflection. That's when it's reflecting off a surface that is not nice and flat and smooth. And as you can see, even though each individual ray bounces off at the angle it actually hits the surface at, these surfaces at different angles everywhere it gets hit by rays, and so they come off at different angles. And all of the light then gets mixed and jumbled together. So the specular one, think of like spectacles, something you can see, you can see a reflection in it. It's going to be nice and smooth like that. The diffuse one is not. It's going to jumble everything up, and it's going to not have nice images on it, like the wall over here is diffuse. If this is nice and clean, it's probably closer to specular, right? And of course, there's in between, nothing's perfectly flat and smooth. But, you know, essentially just thinking about whether or not you can see your reflection nicely in it or whether or not everything gets all jumbled up and like that, okay? But most of the surfaces in here are all diffuse. 
okay? Here, we're gonna form images. Images are where objects appear to be uh, from a mirror or also from a lens. So light reflected from the flower and the vase hits the mirror. It obeys that law of reflection where it bounces off at the same angle it hit at. And the eye, when it looks at the reflection coming off the mirror, it interprets it as coming in a straight line from where, from the angle it basically came to the eye. Think of it this way. If you're sitting here and you're not paying attention and someone over on that side of the room throws a, 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 a what are those called? The little paper airplane and they throw it and it curves around and comes over and hits you on this side of the head. What's the first thing you're going to do if you didn't see it coming? You're going to blame someone over here, right? Even though someone over there threw it. Well, it's similar like that with light. You're looking at this, right? You're looking at this and what you're looking at, it appears as though the light is coming from right there. So that's where the image appears to be, okay? It's not where it's coming from. You don't care about this part. Your eye doesn't ever know that. You only know about the light that enters your eye and then what direction it came from. So it looks like that image is there. So if you're looking at yourself in the mirror, uh, you know, and you're standing like a meter back from the mirror, where does your image appear to be? Two meters away, a meter behind the mirror, right? Okay, and it looks like it's actually in there. Like there is depth inside of mirrors, which is why uh, like a lot of times old, the fashion would be to put a wall of mirror somewhere because it makes the room look larger, all right? And feel larger because it, there is like depth in those mirrors. But it basically forms that. This would be your object uh, and this would be your image. Object and image there. In a flat mirror, uh, there's no magnification that occurs. Your image and your object are the same size and they're however far in front of the mirror the object is, is how far the mirror is, the image is behind the mirror, okay? This kind of a, an image is what is known as a virtual image. And it's known as a virtual image because the image doesn't actually come from there, does it? You can't, if I took and I went behind the mirror and I put a movie screen right there, would there be any image forming on that movie screen? Would there be? No, because none of the light is actually getting there, is it? It just appears to come from there. It appears to come from someplace behind the mirror, but it never actually gets there. So I, it, the light doesn't ever go there, which means there'd be no image, which is why we call it a virtual image. It just appears to be an image there. It's not an image we can actually really do anything with other than look at, okay? So this is known as a virtual image and we'll talk more about that as we go on. Uh, notice here, they've drawn in the rays here and you can see that the rays, the incident rays and the reflecting rays are all the same. So this would be like the angle of incidence. This would be the angle of reflection and they equal each other. All right, and then you can have the other angles then that will appear out of this diagram. Okay, so let's take a look at this example problem. An observer is at table level, a distance D to the left of a flower of height H. So we've got, here's our table. Let's say this is, this is our flower right? I know, impressive. And here's our observer. We'll just put like a little eye or something here. There we go. There's our eye. There's our observer. And they're a distance D from the flower. And the flower has a height H. The flower itself is a distance D to the left of a mirror. So we go over here at distance D again. We have some flat mirror D there. And and you can look on page 910, but there it is. Note that the light of uh, the ray, that a ray of light propagating from the top of the flower to the observer's eye reflects from the mirror at a height Y above the table. So we have some sort of ray coming from the top of this, hitting that and goes back to the observer's eye. It wasn't very good. like that, okay? This is what we have. 
and it's a height y above the table where it hits. It says find y in terms of the height of the flower. So this is where you got to start thinking geometry, right? So let's zoom in on this and see what geometry uh, we can come up with. So first off, we know that if we look, if we come right here through the middle and we draw the normal line out, we know that this angle is theta and this angle here is also theta, they're the same, correct? And the length of my dotted line there is D. Do we agree? And we know that this angle over here is 90 and this angle over here is 90. So what you can see here is, ah, I need to use this thing. What you can see here is I have two right triangles there, don't I? And what can you tell me about those two right triangles? This one up here, this right triangle up here, and then the one right below it. What can you tell me about those two right triangles? What's another word for congruent? They're samesies, right? They're totally, okay? And so we have those two triangles. They are the same. Now I look down here, right? And my eye made this line a little high, but let's pretend that this blue line, you know, comes over here and hits the table like that. Now we look at this one. What's this angle here? Theta. What's this length here? D. What's this angle here? Huh? 90, right? So what does that tell you about that triangle and the other two little triangles? They're the same again, right? So by looking at that, I really don't want this flower part there in the way anymore. What that tells me is this little section right here, y over two. This little section right here, um, not y over two. Yeah, y over two, y over two, y over two. How do I know that? Yeah, if we draw this straight across, this is y right here, correct? These two lines are the same, so they have to be y over two. And since these two are the same and this one up here is the same, they're all three y over two. And then we have the height of our flower h. So what I could say, let's move down here, is I can say that h equals three times y over two. Yes. I'm going to tell you right now, there is probably an infinite number of ways you could make this same conclusion geometrically. Some more complex, maybe even some simpler. Uh, after doing this, I did look in the book, and they did it a totally different way than I did. So you can look in the book at their, this example, which I think is on page 910, and see it done a third geometric or, or another geometric way. So yes, there probably are multiple ways. This is the way that occurred to me when I started noticing, oh yeah, those are the same angle. Oh, that's the same angle. They're all that angle, that distance. So I, oh, a bunch of same triangles, same these triangles, whatever. They'll still say that, I'm pretty sure, right? Same Z's? Pretty sure. Yep, that's the cool lingo. I would know. Okay, and so there we go. Uh, we wanted to find y in terms of h though, so this becomes y equals 2h over three. And that's it. So it's just all about using geometry for these plane mirrors, okay? If you can figure out other ways to do it, go for it, okay? 
Any questions on it? People are mad now geometry is creeping back in. <laughs> I always like geometry. They're fun. All right. And then what was the next one? Uh, two mirrors are placed at right angles and shown in this diagram on page 912. Um, so we'll say mirror and mirror, right angles, okay? Uh, an incident ray of light makes an angle of 30 degrees with the x-axis and reflects from the lower mirror. So in this light ray comes 30 degrees. I don't even want to call it 30. Let's call it theta. And we'll say theta equals 30 degrees. Uh, with the x-axis and reflect from the lower mirror, uh, find the angle the outgoing ray makes with the y-axis after it reflects once from each mirror. So it's going to come in here, hit that mirror, then it's going to reflect off like this, and then it's going to reflect off like this. And what we're interested in is this angle up here, we'll call it phi. Okay. So let's do some geometry stuff, right? If that angle is theta, what's this angle right there? Theta, that's 90 degrees. What's this angle up here? 90 minus theta. What's the angle phi? There we go. Cool. I did this one earlier too, but I didn't do it this way. I did, I started adding in the normal lines. This was easier. I hope I didn't make it too easy and mess up. Y'all please let me know if I did. Okay. So let's get back to uh, let's get back to our lecture thing here. Okay, so we have that. Now let's take a look here. Uh, forming images with a plane mirror. Uh, properties of mirror images produced by plane mirrors. A mirror image is upright. As soon as you see that upright, you're going to associate that with virtual images. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put that here because I want to start really getting you thinking about it. Virtual images are going to be upright. A mirror, in, unless you have multiple mirrors or multiple lenses, if it's just a single one, single mirror, virtual images are upright. A mirror image appears to be the same distance behind the mirror that the object is in front of the mirror. We already talked about that. And a mirror image is the same size as the object. We already talked about that. But start thinking upright means virtual. Uh, forming images, this should make kind of sense based on the example we just did. Uh, a Corner reflector reflects light parallel to the incident ray, no matter what the incident angle is. Well, we just did one that should kind of make sense because if we took that another step, we'd be back to theta, right? We went from theta to 90 minus theta that would take us back to theta if we did it an another way. So it's just doing that problem we just did twice. All right, here we are gonna talk about spherical mirrors. A spherical mirror has the shape of the section of a sphere, okay? Like a small section of a sphere. Uh, if the outside is mirrored, uh, it's called a convex mirror. If the inside of it is mirrored, it's called a concave. It like caves in on the mirror rather than caved. Convex is when it's out, concave is when it's caved in, okay? So here we have two concave mirrors, the reflecting surface is on the inside of the sphere. So it's like it's on the inside of the cave. Uh, and you have what is called a central axis or principal axis there. And it's basically going from the mirror through the center. So it runs through the radius or through uh, the diameter of the sphere. 
And then you have a center of curvature, which is where the center of the sphere would be if it was a full sphere. Okay. And therefore that distance from the mirror out to that center of curvature would be the radius of curvature, the radius of the sphere. And we can, this is only just showing you that you can really just, uh, you know, kind of do it this way. That's that one. And then on this one, you notice they're making the reflecting surface on the outside of it. This would be a convex mirror. So this one's convex. This one is concave. Convex and concave. Notice that the center of curvature is on the backside of the convex mirror. That will be important going along when we start having to determine if numbers are positive or negative. Basically, the, the idea is that when you're dealing with mirrors, if it's on the front side of the mirror, anything on the front side is positive, anything on the back side is negative. It gets a little bit tricky when we do it with lenses. It's all mathematically the same, uh, but it's a little, little twisted there, so. All right, here we go. Parallel rays hitting a spherical mirror come together at the focal point. So if you're looking here, this is a convex mirror. On the left-hand side, you have incoming rays, right? Again, they reflect off the angle they hit at, which just so happens to make them reflect away. See, if we draw this one backwards, if we draw that backwards, it's reflecting away from the focus. So the light will appear, if it comes in parallel to the principal axis, it will appear to have come from the center uh, or not the center, it'll appear to have come from the focus of the mirror. And the focus of the mirror just so happens to be half the radius. Where this is the radius. The radius is the distance to the center. The focus is half of that. So anything that comes in parallel reflects directly away from the focus. Notice all the light rays that are coming in, they spread out. They don't focus to a single point. So what will end up occurring here is we're only going to be able to get virtual images with this because the light never focuses. It spreads out. Okay? Spreads out. Here is a ray diagram for light coming in parallel to the principal axis for a concave mirror. And instead of reflecting away from the focus, they all reflect back through the focus. So if we follow one of these, here it is, comes in parallel to the principal axis and reflects back through the focus, just like that. They all will reflect and meet at the focus. All right. So if you were using a mirror to make a telescope, where would you put your eyepiece? For light rays coming really, really far away, how are they going to enter? Light rays from really, really far away, how do they come in? It's P word, parallel. They all come in parallel, right? So if you point your mirror at the distant star or planet or whatever it is you're looking at, then the light rays are coming in parallel. Now they're coming in parallel to your principal axis, right? So where do you put your eyepiece in order to see all that light focus together? Huge hint with what I just said there. Where do you put the eyepiece so you can see all the light focused together? At the focus. Hey, that's how he got that name. So you put your little eyepiece here and it has like a little tube or something like a little mirror here, a little flat mirror that reflects it over here. And then you use your eye and you look down in there and you're like, oh, hey, 
I can see that image because it all reflected at that point. Same thing with a satellite dish, right? Ever seen a satellite dish? And it has that little arm that comes off and comes over here and then there's a little receiver right there because it reflects everything to that point. That's at the focus of that satellite dish. The satellite dish isn't actually a spherical though. It's not spherical, uh, it's parabolic. But we'll talk about that just in later in this chapter. Okay, well, that's why it's called the focus. Everything focuses to it. Here is what I just said about the focal length being half the radius of it. We usually use that script F for the focal length. And that's gonna be true for both the convex mirror and concave mirror. If you notice, they put a negative one half for the radius of the convex mirror. Uh, I don't like to do that. I just like to think of the radius being on the backside and therefore the radius is negative. And we always want focal lengths to be negative like that. So I still just worry about what's in front of and what's behind the mirror. So I, I would really only just remember this one and it's like, it's true for both of them. And then we worry about which side things are on for positive and negative. One less step of memorization replaced with a step of just thinking about, is it on the positive side or the negative side? Okay, uh, here is where we talk about this. Spherical mirrors, as you get further and further away from the principal axis, they do not actually reflect the light directly through the focus. They get it near the focus. And the further you get away from the center, the further the reflected rays get from the focus. If you wanna fix this, you have to use a parabolic mirror. When you're close to the principal axis, the parabolic mirror is close to being spherical. Right. If you go in real close here, we're essentially saying, all right, we are using a circular mirror like that. I like that perfectly drawn circle. It was impressive, wasn't it? There we go. Hey, that actually worked out really well. See that? So if you're close to it, they're very close in shape. But as you get further away from this, from the central axis, from the pr principal axis, it gets to be a little bit off. And you have this spherical aberrations that appear and it's not quite right. So if you want it to be actually very good, you need a parabolic shaped mirror. And parabolas do have a focus and any light ray that would come in parallel to the principal axis of the parabola would reflect through the focus. That includes one that are far away from the principal axis. As you can see here, this one that's far away ends up being pretty far away from the focus. Whereas here, this one that's far away still is gonna go, well, that didn't work. It's still gonna go directly through the focus. Okay, makes sense. But circular mirrors are much simpler to do with our thin lens, little earth, or our mirror equation, which is the same as the thin lens equation. So we're gonna stick with those. Okay, any questions so far? Are we doing okay? All right. So uh, there you go, Hubble telescope, and we've got, it's a, it's a reflecting telescope with the mirrors in it, okay? Yeah, I do remember that. Y'all remember that? When they, I don't know if y'all are old enough. Were y'all alive when they launched that thing? I remember they launched it and I got up there and the images were bad. They had messed up the mirror and they, they had to like do another mission up there and remove some of its features and replace stuff in there to correct it. But yeah, they had messed up the optics by like a hair. It was barely anything. It's amazing how precise they have to make these big mirrors for telescopes. All right. Uh, here, we're gonna start talking about ray tracing. Uh, for the first time I've ever seen, a book actually labels these different rays, P, F, and C. Uh, one is a ray that's gonna come in parallel to the principal axis, one that is gonna come in through the focus and one that is gonna come in uh, through the center of curvature. And they each do something special. So you can see here, the one that goes in parallel that your book calls the P-ray reflects back to the focus. We've already been talking about that. If you have a light that comes in through the focus, big surprise, it reflects back out parallel. That's the green one. And then if you have one that comes in through the center, it simply reflects back upon itself and goes back out through the center. That's the red one. 
those in through the center and back out through the center. And we can use these three ideas to come up with where images will form when looking at mirrors. Okay, these three main ones. In parallel, out through the focus. In through the focus, out parallel. In through the center, back out through the center. So let's take a look here. Here, we can see we've got some ray tracing going on. What kind of a mirror is this? It says it in there, but don't look. I can't cover it up with my hand. I started to. What is it? Convex. Right, it's bowed outward, it's not the caved in one. It's the convex mirror. So here, it's a little different. A ray that goes in parallel, you can see it there in blue, will reflect away from the focus. Then we have that green ray that goes in toward the focus. The focus is on the back side of the mirror. You can see that green ray coming in. It would continue on along this gray line right there, Right, let me use the highlighter here. It would continue on along this gray line like that, but instead it reflects back out parallel to the principal axis. And then we have the line that would go through the center. You can see it there in red. It tries to go in through the center, but of course it hits the mirror and reflects back out on itself. So those are our three rays. What you notice here is that all three rays are doing what as they come off the mirror? It's a D word. It starts in with a D and ends in diverges. Yeah, they diverge, it diverges. The three rays, they diverge, okay? They're diverging, they're spreading out. So they're not gonna focus any place to give us any kind of actual image that we can really make a use of other than looking at. So that means we're gonna get a virtual image. In order to get this virtual image, you take the three reflected rays and you trace them backwards. You take this one and you trace it backwards. So whenever the rays diverge, you trace the reflections backwards. That would be this one, that'd be the one through the center, and it'd be the one reflecting off right there. And you notice that they all three will meet at one point. This is where the light appears to come from. It will appear to come from there. If you look in that mirror, the light will appear to be there. And what you see is an upright version of your object. And what can you tell me looking at it? It's what? It's smaller, it's reduced, all right? You have probably seen these kinds of mirrors before, maybe in convenience stores like that, those little spherical mirrors and you look at them and everything looks tiny. Or looking at like a spherical Christmas ornament, everything looks tiny, right? All right, that's what's going on here. Every one of those you ever look at, this is basically your only result. An upright, reduced virtual image. No matter how close you get to it, how far away you get it, the further away you get, of course, the smaller you get, but the closer you get, the bigger you get, but it's always reduced. It's always upright, it's always virtual, and it always appears like it's coming from inside the sphere. Okay? If you look at a Christmas ornament and you get your face, it looks like a tiny little face inside the Christmas ornament. Right? Think back anytime you've done that, that's what it looks like. This is your thing you get. This is virtual, upright, reduced. And we can write that. This is a virtual, upright, which pretty much those two go hand in hand, and reduced. Not all virtual images are going to be reduced, but this one is. Virtual, upright, reduced. Yeah. Say that again. Oh, if you... Oh, turn around binoculars. That's refraction. That's not reflection. We'll get to lenses. Don't you worry. And that's multiple lenses. I don't know that we're going to do multiple lenses. If you're going to do multiple lenses, essentially what you do when we do it is, which I don't think we will, but you do one lens and then the image from the first lens is the object for the second lens. And then you just redo it again. There are shortcut ways where you can do it all at once. 
for like binoculars and stuff where you don't have to work the problem out. If you have, if you have two lenses, you don't have to work it out every time. You, you can reduce it down to one thing, but that's essentially what is happening. So you're taking the image of one thing and it's the object for the next one, because that's what the next one thinks all the light is coming from as though that object was there, but you're getting ahead of me anyway with lenses. Okay, so virtual upright reduced. Any questions on that? All right, how about this one? This is for a concave mirror. And so let's take a look at this first one. You see the principal ray going in parallel to the principal axis, right? That's, that's gonna be this one, goes into the parallel, reflects out through the focus. Then you've got the one that goes in through the focus and reflects out parallel. The one they're not showing would be the one that goes in through the center, would hit the mirror down here and then reflect back out through the center. But notice, even when I do that, look at what happens. Here's the reflection, here's the reflection. What's happening with all three of the reflections? They're converging. They're converging on one point. That is where all the light then focus to. And if you're looking in that mirror, that's where the object would appear to be. It would appear to be like it was floating in front of the mirror closer to you than the mirror and flipped upside down. So this is, this is uh, an inverted, reduced, and what is called a real image. It's a real image because if we took and we did every point on here, say we had like the middle point, we could do the middle point out. Oh, oh sorry, I didn't do that very straight. We'd go over here, go through, go through the focus, and we go there. And we could go through the focus and then out parallel. And you could go through the center and back out through the center. And you'd notice right there, all three of those reflected rays, they meet up right in the center of that arrow, right where they all started from, correct? And if we did the bottom, they'd all end up at the bottom. If we did three-fourths of the way up, they'd end up three-fourths of the way, I guess, down. They'd end up, you know, over here on the arrow. So we're going to get a completely remade version where every bit of light that comes from there is going to end up there. And it's going to end up in the same, you know, the same location there. And we're going to actually get an image there. And if we were to take and put a movie screen there, and we put a movie screen right there, what would we see on the movie screen? What? Yeah, we'd see an upside down picture right there. We'd see it upside down. And it would be right there and we'd have that image. And that's why we call it a real image. We can actually project it onto a screen because all the rays that come from it reflect back through there. Okay? Now, are there only three actual rays that come off of this thing? We're only drawing three. How many, how many actual light rays are there? Yeah, infinite. I mean, they're coming out at all kinds of crazy angles. Don't think there's only these three. There's gonna be some that come up this way and then they'll bounce down through the same point. Every one of them is gonna bounce down. If we, if we take it from the top there, they're all gonna bounce back through that same point like that. It's just that these three we're doing, they're easy to do, okay? Because we always know where they're gonna go. If they go in parallel, they're out through the focus. If it comes in at some weird angle, not going through the focus, not going through, I mean, then I'm not exactly sure where it's gonna go. That's, that's much more difficult. These are just three easy ones to do that then give us the location that all of them will reflect to. That makes sense? And see, this would be much more difficult if we were trying to draw out the wave fronts coming from this, right? I mean, these are all 90 degree angles and stuff like that, but that's gonna be a lot harder to have that wave front reflect off the mirror, which is why we do the rays. All right, uh, last one real quick. Here you see the rays going out. You have the one going in through the principal axis or, or parallel to the principal axis. 
out through the focus, right? Out through the focus, in through the focus, out parallel, and look where they both meet. Now we are inside the center of curvature, so that's kind of hard to do. You can do one that as though it comes from here and bounces back through, but you don't need to do that. You really only have to do at least just two of them to get where they overlap. So if we do those two, we can see that this reflection meets this reflection right there, and that's where our image is gonna form. We did it from the top of the arrow, and that's gonna tell us where the top of the arrow is. Any other place you did in there will just you know, line up properly. You did halfway down the arrow would give you, you know, they'd all meet right there. And what you see there is we have another image. Is this a real image or a virtual image? Huh? Real. The light is converging. So it's real. And plus, it's inverted. Inverted and real, keep those together. Upright, virtual, keep those together for single lenses and single mirrors. That's true. So when you look at your mirror in the morning, you're getting yourself all ready and everything, and you look in the mirror, is that a real image or a virtual one? Virtual. It's upright, same size, upright, and it's behind the mirror. The light diverges. So it meets up right there. We have this. So the properties of this one are, oops, sorry, real, upright. Remember, those two go together. Almost always keep those two together. Oh, sorry, inverted. Yes, I'm say, saying one inverted. Keep those two together, and it's enlarged. It's larger than it appears. This is how, you know, this is how you can see stuff with it, right? Make something look larger between the focus and the center. All right, and I think we can pick up from there tomorrow, okay? We will do at the focus and inside the focus still. You can also do at the center too. Any guesses on how, what the magnification would be for at the center? Outside the center, it was reduced. Inside the center, it's enlarged. What do you think is going to happen at the center? Same size. Still real, still inverted, but same size. All right, y'all. Have a great day.